We have now time for a limited number of uh, questions due to the late hour already. So let's start with James. Uh, thank you, Alexander. It's James Crisp from the Daily Telegraph. I'm over here, uh, Secretary of State. Wrong. Over the other side. Yeah. Um, Secretary of State, you've said in the past that the payment of a Brexit bill should be conditional on a future trade deal. Uh, this isn't what was agreed under your predecessor. Do you stand by that? And Mr. Barnier, um, I'd be interested in your views on uh, Mr. Rabb's previous comments regarding the bill. But you've also said that, if the, that the EU will adapt if the UK changes its red lines or, adapt, or evolves its position. Do you think the white paper has evolved the position sufficiently? And if so, when will you uh, adapt in term? So firstly, on the, um, the question you uh, directed at me, we've been clear, as indeed the EU has all along, that there is no deal until we do the whole deal that the various different aspects, the withdrawal agreement, the protocol and the political declaration come as a, a package as a whole. And uh, we had a good constructive conversation today about, in practice, how we make sure there is that link between those two key areas, the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration on the future framework. If uh, Dominic will allow me, it is indeed quite right that there is an agreement on nothing until we have agreement on everything. But what is perfectly clear to the 27 EU member states and to the European Parliament is that what has been, uh, what was agreed in December and in March, March uh, has been agreed uh, for good. Now, of course, in terms of legal certainty, that will come with uh, the ratification of the final treaty towards which we're working. We have to avoid uh, any possible misunderstanding, so I'm, I'm glad you put this very question. The United Kingdom has decided, as is its sovereign right, to leave the European Union. Theresa May, like Dominic, have uh, confirmed that when they leave the EU, they want to leave the single market as well. They know the rules uh, of the single market perfectly. They know the indivisibility of the four freedoms that uh, are fundamental to the uh, single market, and they want to leave the customs union as well. And of course, they know too the a uh, key condition to that, which is being part and parcel of a strong trade policy, common trade policy. Now, these are uh, the red lines that have been laid down, and I haven't heard any mention that they have changed in the meantime. Now, of course, one might want to have a customs arrangement. We're working on that and towards that, to giving a, a joint content to these words a customs union, well, uh, we're, uh, or is it something else? We're willing and, and to, to work towards that. But the United Kingdom knows how we function and how we do our work. So in terms of uh, our approach, it's not ideological, it's not dogmatic. We're talking about uh, the economy. Since the Single European Act, which was put in place with the United Kingdom since 1993, with uh, the removal of internal borders within the single market, we have created an ecosystem of law, of rules, of regulations, common certification for products, uh, and a common body of rules and regulations. And first and foremost, a single legal jurisdiction. That is what the United Kingdom is leaving, but we will continue within this and continue working to improve uh, uh, and strengthen this ecosystem. We don't want to undermine it or destabilize it. That's not something which is negotiable for the European Union. I say this based on the guidelines of the EU 27, the unanimous guidelines laid down by the heads of state and government in March. There's no poss possible way for us to allow this ecosystem, the single market, 
uh, which embodies the single market to be to allow this to be uh, undermined in any way or destabilized because the United Kingdom is, is leaving. Now, in the medium to long term, I would say that uh, for the United Kingdom, it would not be in, in your interest either to have a destabilized single market. So that is the key point which we have to bear in our uh, in mind at all times. We have a lot of uh, other issues which we're working on. Uh, on a very constructive spirit. We all, of course, uh, on both sides, we want to respect the fundamental principles. And I re reminded uh, uh, us of one in particular, and that is that we need to respect each other's decision-making autonomy. And then, is there somebody behind the cameras whom I cannot see? No. All right, Patty. Um. Paddy, Paddy Smith, Irish Times. Um, Mr. Rabb, I wanted to come to you about the, the thorny issue of, of, of the backstop. We've, we've seen in the last uh, couple of weeks the Commission very seriously trying to what uh, Mr. Barnier has called de-dramatise the idea of uh, technical checks and customs controls on the Irish Sea. And uh, he makes the point, or he's made the point, that these checks already exist in, in relation to agricultural produce and laws. Uh, how do you justify insisting that such measures actually have constitutional implications when you already have such measures in, in place? And why could you not see uh, some move uh, uh, along those lines towards recognizing uh, the, the, the possibility of creating a, a separate Northern Ireland um, customs area? We, we are committed to, um, for the exceptional circumstances that I mentioned earlier, making sure we translate the commitment in the joint report into a protocol on the backstop. Uh, but as we've said consistently, and the position hasn't changed, we will not do anything that will threaten the economic or, or constitutional uh, integrity of the UK. And we will keep working on all those technical issues, uh, looking at the proposals on all sides, asking questions ourselves, indeed, of the EU's position. But we're confident that actually, with a bit of imagination and with goodwill and the spirit of the negotiations that we've had so far, we will be able to get a workable solution. And it needs to be workable. Well, as Dominique said, I just have to reiterate what our thinking is. At no time whatsoever did we want to create a border between uh, Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. Not at all. We have to resolve a problem. We have to find a solution. It's a real problem that's been created by Brexit. It's Brexit that's created this problem. Uh, between Ireland and Northern Ireland, which does uh, risk the Good Friday, uh, Friday Agreement. So we've got to find a solution to uh, the Good Friday Agreement. We need some practical solutions, and that's why we have proposed this backstop. But we need a backstop. Whether it's our backstop, well, we can discuss that. But we need a backstop that is made up of measures that are legally uh, uh, valid at the time when the agreement is signed, which is why I had asked that we should de-dramatize this whole issue. I mean, of course, we have technical controls, special controls. Some of them are already implemented in Northern Ireland for products that come in from the remainder of the UK uh, into Belfast, so they already exist there. So we've got to go through this, a list of control by control to see what has to be done. Uh, and we've got to find a UK-wide solution to uh, customs controls. So that's the basis for our work, and we hope that in the weeks to come we will be able to look at things in terms of an operational and practical approach, not an ideological one. Um, Mr. Barney, I, I really do have to press you on this, I'm afraid. Um, the Chequers White Paper um, led to two resignations from the government, government's uh, cabinet because of uh, the evolution um, 
that it represented in terms of um, the government's position and, and British politics. Your negotiating mandate, and I think it was repeated again in council conclusions, makes it clear that if the British government's position evolves, the EU will reconsider um, its offer to do you consider that Chequers white paper an evolution and not, and if it's not an evolution, then clearly for you it is um, unworkable and not a basis for further talk. So you can be absolutely clear on that, please. And Mr. Rabb, um, the Chequers white paper was a political gambit um, that propelled you um, to high office. It seems pretty clear from what Mr. Barnier is telling us that that political gambit um, has failed. Where does that now leave the British strategy just months away from um, the deadline of negotiating this withdrawal agreement. I'm not going to comment on the domestic and political debate in, in the United Kingdom. I respect uh, this debate, this ongoing debate, and I don't want to intervene in it in any way or to make any, any comments on who is in the government or isn't in the government or on domestic political issues. We negotiate with uh, Theresa May, with Dominic Rabb, and with their team. And I must say, on, on both sides, the teams, uh, I must say a word of thanks to them because they are extremely competent and professional on a very serious issue, namely organizing the United Kingdom's uh, orderly withdrawal from the European Union and preparing the ground for a future partnership between the EU and the UK. For months now, uh, in the press room, uh, I've been saying that the United Kingdom should tell us exactly what it wants. Now, I'm not going to, s to contradict myself now. We uh, welcome the uh, discussion in Chequers and uh, the document which came out of that. We studied it carefully. I have once again, speaking here, set out uh, some of the positive uh, points. Uh, and I think this document can be useful in making progress. And on, on the basis of these positive points in the economic field, for example, where the white paper uh, sets out a proposal in favor of an ambitious free trade agreement, that's what we're proposing too. And from the outset, in particular in the uh, European Council guidelines. So it calls for custom arrangements. I've said that we need to agree on the precise content. There are a lot of other points uh, of cooperation where we can find some common ground, I believe, uh, in terms of creating a sound foundation for our future relationship. And there are other points at the same time. Again, I don't want to intervene in the internal political debate, but there are other points of which we have a problem because they contradict the they clash with the uh, European Council guidelines. So they, they, they contradict my clear negotiating guidelines. Indivisibility of the four freedoms, the integrity of the single market, these are the key, key points. This is our main asset and we're not going to negotiate on that, on the indivisibility. The United Kingdom has known that from the outset. There are other issues too on the feasibility of the proposed uh, customs arrangements and dual taxation. Well, there's no reason why EU businesses should have to bear the administrative or financial cost of the UK's decision to leave the European Union. So what I'm trying to set out here uh, in, in terms of giving you the background to the European Council guidelines. The United Kingdom has decided to leave the European Union. It's that way around, not the other way around. And our, we propose to maintain our strength, our asset, our main asset, which is the European single market in all its dimensions. Well, you referred to the Chequers principles as a gambit. In fact, they are now fleshed out into a white paper with a detailed set of serious, credible, workable proposals, but of course, the subject of negotiation. We've had a good discussion this week at technical level. Um, Michelle and I have had a good meeting uh, today. 80% um, of the withdrawal agreement, more or less, has been uh, agreed, as, as Michelle has said. Um, we've got further issues and questions to resolve on the backstop, that's clear, but we've also got the resolve 
to address those issues and come to the right conclusion in time. And we've got a good template for the future relationship uh, or in the, in the um, shape of the white paper. And Michelle talked about uh, the UK and the EU um, having strong cooperation, respecting the autonomy of each side. And I think that's an important principle. And with ambition and pragmatism and energy on all sides, well, we can get there in October. Last question goes to Adam. Hi. Um, <coughs> would either of you welcome the intervention of... Um, would either of you um, welcome the intervention of heads of state and government, perhaps, to update the guidelines or give this whole process a bit of a push? And actually, at what point, with respect to both of you, do you just go, actually, we can't do this, it needs to be the leaders that do it? <coughs> well... Uh, probably Dominic needs his leader to push ahead. I also, on a constant basis, want my leaders. I'm in the negotiator of the EU. I'm working and I work on the basis of the trust uh, put in me by President Juncker as well as uh, the other institutions. Uh, we need the expertise. The UK wants to leave. It wants to be associated uh, but I'm working on the basis of the mandate handed down to me by the European Council. I mean, I don't need to say this to you, but I constantly need the backing of the institutions. Every three months, I work with the heads of government and state, the foreign ministers, as I did last Friday. I report to them, I take stock of the situation, I anal analyze the, the white paper, uh, and everyone spoke on the basis of uh, what the different governments of the member states uh, say. So I work on their behalf. So anyone who wants to find a sliver of a difference between my mandate and what the heads of government and state want, well, they're wasting their time, actually. I, I think from the UK's perspective, obviously, um, we're conscious of the pressures on all sides in relation to this negotiation, but the reality is we've got some core principles we do agree on and a large amount of the technical detail which we've concluded. It's the job of Michelle and myself to focus on coming up with the technical resolution of some of those issues that can be resolved that way, to make the compromises with the necessary flexibility and pragmatism. And we. I feel through the proposals we've set out and the movement we've made to date have shown our willingness. And I think if we continue with that vein, solving problems, resolving outstanding issues with energy, with enthusiasm, with goodwill on all sides, we'll get there. Okay, uh, Jennifer, you had you on the list. It's really the last one. Uh, thank you. So a question from the, the Guardian uh, to Mr. Rubb. Uh, you. Uh, you talked about the, all the uh, areas of progress and uh, the, the, deals you, uh, the deals you want to strike with the EU, but can the rest of your party accept what appears to many of them to be Brexit in name only? Do you think they, you will carry them with you? And turning to the other wing of your, of your party, um, there have also been calls for a second referendum. Nothing that's being negotiated now was on the ballot paper. So should this be put again to, to the British people for a second, refer a second referendum? Well, on the second referendum, clearly not. We've always said we need to respect the democratic verdict. Uh, all parties in the House of Commons at the time of the legislation uh, accepted that we need to respect the outcome. Um, in terms of, of course, there are different views on the EU side, on the UK side. It's the job of Michelle and I to forge a principled, pragmatic approach which, and from the UK side, gives effect to the referendum, but also strikes the kind of cooperation from trade to security in the other areas that, as Michelle has rightly said, I could have said it uh, myself, uh, respects the autonomy of both sides, but seeks to strive and forge strong areas of cooperation in all of those areas where we've got strong mutual interests. This will conclude our press conference. Can I please ask you to stay seated to allow the principals the orderly withdrawal from the press room? So please uh, stay seated.